Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Eye Associates Site for Life and so much more. I'm Jill Graw, Medical Services Director at the Eye Associates. The Eye Associates specializes in restoring and improving sight. We take great pride in our vast knowledge, educational standards, and quality patient care. I'm proud to say that we've been repeatedly chosen as best ophthalmologists, best optometrists, and best eyewear by our community. Today, we will be talking about the retina and some of the conditions that can cause vision loss, and of course, what you can do to protect your vision. Here to talk to me is Dr. B.J. Ahn and Dr. Michael Camp, both excellent physicians at the Eye Associates. Welcome, doctors. Thanks for having Thank us, Jill. Dr. Camp, I know that you're a board-certified uh, optometric physician. I know you've been with the Eye Associates for over 20 years. I'd like to brag on you a little bit. I know you graduated the top 10 of your class, but would you like to tell our audience a little bit about your practice? Yes, practicing with the Eye Associates, um, it's been obviously many years, and I've kind of got in the habit of seeing pretty much any patient that, that needs services. So I've got patients as young as age three, and I've got a patient that was in very recently at 105. So pretty much if there's an eye condition or something that needs to be addressed, I'm, they're on my schedule, I'm taking care of them. Great, well, Dr. Ahn, I know that it's very interesting that you were an optometric physician first, and then you decided to go back to school and become a retina doctor. Can you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and your practice? Uh, yes, Jill, you know, ever since I was a little kid, I've been interested in the eye, and this led me to first uh, pursue a career in optometry. And I practiced several years as an optometrist and really enjoyed it. It helped me um, examine people's eyes, helped them with their eyes. But, you know, I wanted to pursue a little bit more education and decided to go to medical school where I went at the University of Vermont uh, College of Medicine. Then I furthered my education at uh, the New York Medical College where I did my ophthalmology residency. Following that, I did my retina fellowship at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. Baskin Palmer, that's very impressive, Dr. Ahn. Thank you. Now, Dr. Ahn, tell us, what is the retina and where is it located in the eye? So retina is an important part of the eye and it is located in the back part of the eye. And it's an important part because it takes in all the information that we see from the outside and transmit that information to the brain. And subsequently, the brain processes this vision. And so it is a very important part of the eye. So, Dr. Ahn, what are some of the retina conditions that actually threaten our vision? There are quite a few, but some of the more common conditions that I see include retinal detachment, retinal tears, vitreous detachments, floaters, macular degeneration, and diabetic retinopathy. Now, Dr. Camp, I know that you conduct comprehensive eye exams. Yes. How often are you asked about floaters? It's a good question because it's a very common question. Any given day, five patients, six patients, maybe even more than that, are coming in there with questions about floaters and concerns about what they can do about it. Now, <coughs> Dr. Ahn, I've heard flashes and floaters together. What actually does that mean? So flashes and floaters are symptoms that many people may present with, and they often come together. And typically, they're commonly associated with a condition called a vitreous detachment or a vitreous separation. And that's a fairly common condition. However, sometimes it can mean uh, a more serious eye condition, such as a retinal tear or retinal detachment. So it could be uh, something more serious as well. Well, now, Dr. Camp, what would you advise a patient to do if they are experiencing flashes and floaters? Basically, if a, if a patient is experiencing those kind of symptoms, you know, and, and they're on the phone with somebody in our call center, they're going to be advised to come in you know, within a that day, maybe a day or two at the most, depending on the severity, to have, you know, a full eye exam where we're going to assess the visual system, of course, but more importantly, dilate the eyes and get a l good look inside and see what the retina is doing, make sure there's not problems with the vasculature inside the eye. Well, I want to go back to the floaters question for just a minute. What exactly is the floaters? I mean, basically, floater is just you know, kind of a, a aging or kind of degradation of the gel in the back of the eye. And um, very common for this to happen um, as we get older, but also, you know, younger patients too. But it's, it's really the symptoms that get the patients alarmed. Well, then, Dr. Camp, what is 
the difference between a retina tear and a retina detachment? I mean, a, kind of a simple explanation is a, a retina tear is basically a smaller area of the retina. Just imagine like, just like a little tear in your shirt or something where uh, the retina has got a little issue and again, it's going to present with those symptoms. So we want to get the patient because we would want that, that treated so it didn't lead to a more permanent you know, visual or, or a bigger vision issue. A retinal detachment is essentially just a larger area, much more sight threatening, more, more serious condition that again, still the same evaluation, the dilation, but it, it's the treatment stuff that would, would vary between the two. Well now Dr. Ahn, what would you do <coughs> for a retinal tear? So for the retinal tear, we're often um, able to treat this in our office and we would usually do a laser treatment around the tear to prevent it from getting worse. Uh, in certain instances, we'll use a cryo, which is a freezing probe, and we create a, a freezing seal around the retinal tear. Now, then what would you do for a retinal detachment? Now, retinal detachment um, is a more serious condition and usually will require uh, a, a, a surgery in the operating room. So there are a few different procedures, surgical procedures we can do for retinal detachment. Uh, one is called a scleral buckle, where we put a band around the, the sclera, the outer part of the eye, to stabilize and support the retina. Also, we have a procedure called vitrectomy, where we remove the vitreous gel in the center, followed by a laser, um, as well as a gas bubble that goes in to press against the detached retina and tries to flatten it. Uh, in addition, there's also a procedure called the pneumatic retinopexy, which can be done in the office, um, and that is where we inject a bubble, a, ga a gas bubble, inside the eye to uh, flatten the retina. Now, Dr. Camp, I want to change direction a little okay. bit. I know that there are more than 21 million Americans with diabetes. Do you see a lot of diabetic patients? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really reaching epidemic proportions here in, in America with 21 million diagnosed cases, and they're projecting or predicting that there's like an, another 8 million cases undiagnosed. So very important to get you know, the, all those patients in for evaluations. A lot of times they can be asymptomatic and it really unfortunately is one of the diseases that can actually affect younger patients. So it's not just you know, the older, elderly patients where we're maybe seeing the macular or other retina problems, but diabetes doesn't really single itself out at any certain age group. Well, Dr. Kemp, how often should a mm -hmm. diabetic patient actually come in for a comprehensive eye exam? I mean, pretty much, you know, the, the eye associates protocol would be, a, a, you know, a yearly visit where we would obviously assess the visual um, system, you know, checking glasses, contacts, that kind of need. But again, more importantly, getting the, the retina, di or the pupil dilated so we can get evaluate of the, of the retina and the vessels inside the eye. Now, once a patient or if a patient is diagnosed with actually complications from diabetes, that patient may be in you know, more frequently, every six months, every four months, obviously some kind of a treatment that we'd send, you know, to the retina specialist. It just kind of depends on the severity of the situation. Now, Dr. <coughs> Camp, I believe you were telling me that the eye is the only place in the body that you can look at the blood vessels without being invasive. Yeah, it, it's really unique. Obviously, and again, why we keep talking about this dilated visit is you get the pupil open so we get a better look internally. We can literally look at the, vet, the blood supply. Um, and, you know, there's lots of, you know, particular diseases in addition to just diabetes. Um, hypertension can affect the blood vessels. Um, we can look for other things based when we look internally, looking at the optic nerve, multiple, uh, multiple sclerosis, for example, and some other conditions that might go undetected initially if, if they weren't seen by the eye, the eye care professional. So you're mm -hmm. actually di diagnosing multiple health Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely potential that somebody's there for what they think is just, hey, I'm here for my eye exam, and we're actually finding things that you know, might have a little bit more significance in their life. Well now, is a diabetic eye exam different from a regular eye exam? I would say, you know, with, with the eye associates, you know, physicians, I would say not. Because if, if somebody's in for a, for a comprehensive exam or even one, maybe a follow-up to one of these retinal exams, we're going to be dilating and looking internally. Um, I, I think that uh, some patients feel like, hey, the, an exam is just to figure out my vision, and they maybe don't take the dilation part of it seriously. So if you're seeing, you know, whoever your eye care professional is, please insist that they dilate and look inside. Don't try to avoid it. Well, Dr. Camp, then what are some of the eye-related complications from diabetes? I mean, the more common things are, you know, patients may present with either blurred, you know, blurred vision, you know, maybe even assuming it's just going to be a, an eyeglasses type of issue. Um, 
but other things, the dry eyes can be exacerbated in a diabetic, uh, glaucoma, cataracts, you know, there's, there's lots of things that can be affected you know, and maybe amplified if a patient's diabetic. So, <coughs> Dr. Ahn, how does a patient know if they have diabetic retinopathy? That's a great, great, great question, uh, Jill. You know, over five million Americans are estimated to have diabetic retinopathy. Uh, some of them do have symptoms, um, like Dr. Camp had mentioned, but many of them do not. And so it's really important to come in and get your eyes checked uh, with a dilated uh, exam because that's the best way to check for diabetic retinopathy and get uh, treatment if necessary because early detection is important in early treatment and prevention of vision loss and, um, and, the, and the loss of vision and further uh, other di the disease. So then early stages may not have any symptoms? Uh, that's correct. And, um, you know, there was actually a, a patient I recently saw that was referred by an optometrist. Uh, the patient originally went to um, see the optometrist because, you know, he had some blurred vision, thought maybe he needed glasses. However, um, the optometrist saw some bleeding in the back of the eye and asked the patient to come and see me. And when I examined the eye, there was um, diabetic retinopathy. And I was able to uh, treat this patient and help him see better so um, he could go back to his regular activities. But certainly very important to uh, get your eyes checked, even though you may not have a uh, lot of symptoms. And it kind of goes back to that, you know, that it can be all age groups. Again, maybe not children, but, you know, young adults and beyond all potentially can have involvement, you know, internally. I think that's what you were saying earlier. A lot of times people think they need glasses, yep. and it's not glasses again, at all. Fortunately, oftentimes that is all they need, and, and, and those needs are, are addressed as well. But it's, 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 it's those rare cases, those are the ones you're really looking for. So, Dr. An, then what are some of the treatments for patients with diabetic retinopathy? So, we have some very good treatments available for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, currently, we use a lot of intravitreal injections uh, for diabetic macular edema, but we've also been using a uh, retinal laser to uh, decrease some of the bleeding as well to stabilize the retina and uh, to prevent the further progression of the disease. So how, how do they actually control or prevent complications from diabetes, Dr. Camp? I mean, some things that, that may or may not seem obvious, but, you know, proper diet, exercise, you know, really carefully monitoring what their blood sugars and their A1C levels are. Um, you'll probably hear this a few times during our discussion today, but smoking is, is a really a significant risk factor. So patients that are out there smoking, I think they've heard it before, but they really need to quit is the bottom line. And, and what about the little Amsler grid? Is that something that yeah, they could use? Something like this simple card here. It basically is a, a grid pattern that literally just takes a few seconds for a patient to observe and see if they um, are kind of detecting any central blur or distortion. And yeah. Now, I know that uh, anybody who's watching can actually stop at any one of our offices, pick up a free AMSR grid. They can also print one out on our website. Um, the graphic is on the screen, so please... Um, look into getting an AMSR grid and start using that. Yeah, I mean, it literally just takes a few seconds per eye per day to, to, to kind of monitor things. But now, Dr. Camp, don't you also recommend the AMSR grid for patients with macular degeneration? Yeah, I'm actually glad you wrote that. And basically, any patient that's been diagnosed with any kind of you know, retinal disease, whether it be macular degeneration, diabetes, um, even hypertension, they're at risk of these central distortions. So something like that grid pattern will allow them to kind of monitor at home and let their doctor know if, you know, if there's some kind of progression. Um, in addition to the grid that's been around, I don't know how many years, I mean, I've been practicing o over 20, the, the grid was out before I got here, but there's actually an FDA approved digital device also that is kind of prescribed or is prescribed by a, a patient's physician and for use in monitoring um, macular degeneration. And it will detect those changes and it actually notifies the doctor directly and the doctor would obviously get a hold of the patient and, and get them in and do a, a further evaluation. So that's kind of a newer, a newer technology in addition to that, that simple, as I referenced it, that, that little piece of paper. 
well, still a very important piece of paper. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, Dr. Ahn, earlier you explained the retina. Can you now explain to us what is the macula? So the macula um, is a central part of the retina, and it's, a, it's an important part of the retina because the macula has special cells that allow us to read the small print. And so when you're reading a book or magazine or even street signs, you're using the macula. Okay, well now, Dr. Camp, can you tell us what is macular degeneration? I mean, macular degeneration is basically a disease that will affect central vision. So it presents with, uh, you know, blur or distorted vision. Um, when we look inside the eye, we see these little deposits that are kind of a yellow, whitish colored deposit called drusen. And um, basically, it, it affects even everyday life things. It really ends up, what, what ends up happening. So then, how exactly do you diagnose it? Basically, I feel like I'm going to repeat a few times here today, and Dr. Ahn, I'm sure, will too, is it's really, that comes down to a, a thorough dilated evaluation. We're really getting a look with our equipment into the eye to look at what the blood supply and what especially that central area called the macula, you know, how it's performing. Well, are there different types of macular degeneration? Dr. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 probably the, the, the basic way of describing it is there's a dry form and a wet form. Um, the dry form makes up 85 or 90 percent of the population you know, that are diagnosed with the disease. The remaining 15 or 20 percent are the wet form. Um, I guess it sounds good because the percentages are in the favor of dry, but unfortunately it, 90 percent of the severe vision loss cases are within that wet category. One little caveat is not every patient that has the dry form will progress to be the wet form. So I want people to understand that you know, the diagnosis is important and, and following protocols with, with, your, with your eye doctor is important, but I don't want them all wondering, am I gonna go to that severe level? Because fortunately, they don't all go there. Well, Dr. Ahn, what can you do about the dry macular degeneration? So there's actually many things that one can do about the dry macular degeneration. Now, if you are a smoker, the best uh, advice is to stop smoking because you know it affects diabetes, also the macular degeneration. And also, it's important to uh, exercise regularly, um, control your blood pressure and cholesterol, as well as eat a healthy diet rich in green leafy ve vegetables, as well as uh, fish. Now, there's some um, omega-3 uh, in fish uh, that's helpful for this macular degeneration, as well as uh, we recommend some vitamin supplements for people with dry macular degeneration. And use the AMSR grid daily. Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Ahn, speaking of uh, vitamin therapy, can you tell us a little bit about, about the ARADS study? I mean, I know there's ARADS 2 study and what the formulation, cha the formulation changes were. Sure, Jill. So the ARADS study stands for the Age-Related Eye Disease Study. And there were two studies, the ARADS study and the ARADS 2 study. And fairly large, 4,000 people or more in each study over five plus years. And some people were given a certain vitamin formulation. For the original ARADS, it was vitamin A, C, E, and zinc. And uh, other people were taking a placebo. And when they compared these two groups over five years, those who took the vitamin formulation did better by about a 25% difference. So for the AREDS 2 study, they wanted to see if there are other supplements that will have additional benefits. So they added lutein, zeaxanthine, and omega-3 fatty acid. And uh, the study results show that people taking the original AREDS formula versus AREDS 2, they both did quite similarly and very well in terms of preventing uh, the disease from progressing to the advanced form of the macular degeneration. So then, Dr. Camp, what, what changes from the ARADS-1 and ARADS-2 formulation was there? Was there something that was taken out? Yeah, probably the, the, the main take home that is when I describe it is the original formulation had beta carotene. And it's been proven that the beta carotene can, that is found it, you know, the, um, can affect smokers. So it, to avoid that additional health risk, the beta carotene was taken out, the zeaxanthine and lutein and the omega-3s were added into the supplement. So pretty much at, at our office, I, I believe that the general consensus is, I know with myself, is I just have everybody getting the AREDS too. There's multiple companies that, that copy that formulation, so there's not necessarily one brand, but I think if they do the AREDS too, they're still getting their 25% reduction in risk and, and just, it just kind of takes the beta carotene out of the mix. It didn't really seem to make a big improvement anyways between the two, the, the two formulations. 
Now, <clears throat> Dr. Ahn, can you explain the difference between dry macular degeneration and wet macular degeneration? Yes, Jill. Um, Dr. Camp alluded to dry macular degeneration a little bit, but there's in the dry, there's the um, yellowish whitish deposits called drusen that accumulates, and over many years it may progress, and some people may develop a condition called the wet macular degeneration. Now, we call it the wet because there's an abnormal blood vessel that's growing, and it bleeds and can cause swelling that will affect uh, people's vision. And this wet macular degeneration can be more aggressive, uh, decreasing people's vision uh, more quickly in a short period of time. Well, then, Dr. Ahn, what are you doing for your patients with wet macular degeneration? So we have some very good treatments uh, for wet macular degeneration. Uh, we have several different medications that we can use that we give as an injection into the eye. We call these intravitreal injections. And they have been uh, able to stabilize patients' vision, and in some cases improve their vision, and has been uh, good for long-term treatment. And you know, I remember seeing a patient recently where the lady um, came with new onset change in her vision on the ampullary grid. And after examining her, I said, you know, you have this wet macular degeneration. Uh, fortunately, we have some good treatments available to treat this. And you know, she shared uh, a story where she said, you know, about 20 years ago, her mother developed this wet macular degeneration. And at that time, unfortunately, we didn't have that many great treatments available. And although her mother had lost a lot of her vision uh, 20 years ago from this condition, she was uh, uh, happy to hear that we have good treatments and we have a great chance to uh, save her vision and possibly even improve her vision with these intravitreal injections. Well, you know, Dr. Ahn, hearing you say an injection in the eye, that sounds frightening for a patient. How, how do you try to help a patient overcome that? Yeah, Jill, I mean, truly, you know, the thought of a needle into the eye can be, you know, frightening and anxiety provoking for a lot of people. And we understand that we try to be uh, gentle, um, as much as possible, you know, first we want to make sure that the eye is perfectly numb with uh, anesthetic eye drops or uh, gel that we put into the white part of the eye. Then we use a antiseptic solution called betadine. And then I use a very small needle and the injection is done in the white part of the eye. And before you know it, it's, it's done and over. And most people say that usually the thought of the injection was a lot worse than the injection itself. But um, definitely it's important f to get the treatment so that uh, we can stabilize the vision and prevent further vision loss. And it's, a lot of people have had great success with these uh, treatments. I mean, Dr. Ahn and I share you know, quite a few patients, and um, I truly don't hear patients complaining about the injections. I'm sure they're not happy that they're having to have them. But they find that the, you know, especially after that first one, um, you know, he's a gentle guy. He, he treats everybody, you know, on a personal level. And honestly, they're so happy that they're getting the, 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 the improvement in vision, the stabilization of vision, that they, they just don't complain about going back for their subsequence. I, I just, I literally don't hear it, which is the test to, you know, his skills, obviously, and, and the other retina guys in the, in the office. Mm, it's very important to help patients be, be feel, feel comfortable about this. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Ahn, what does the future for macular degeneration look like? Are there going to be new treatments on the horizon? What does it look like? Uh, Jill, you know, the future is actually very good. Um, you know, we are coming out with newer medications, or they're studying a lot of different medications. We already have uh, medicine that's supposed to uh, last longer in the eye. And uh, so people don't need to have as frequent injections. And there's also a growing number of research on the dry macular degeneration because it affects a large number of people. And although we have the AREDS vitamin, we don't have many other treatment available. But I, I believe in the future, uh, we'll have many other products that we can offer uh, to our patients with this disease. And I believe that the, Dr. Camp, you were talking to me the other day about studies. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's interesting. Obviously, we all need studies and research to develop these new products. So I'll brag a little bit about the eye associates. We've, we've been involved in, and are ongoingly involved in multiple studies. Some of the uh, macular degeneration treatment studies, diabetes treatment studies, glaucoma studies, even simple things like new contact lenses and things like that that are out there. Um, and we're often able to offer patients treatments before they're available 
you know, to the masses, but also it gets them out there so that you know, lots and lots of people can, can benefit from these you know, newer treatments. So we're, we're, we're kind of proud that we're involved with that. Mm, that's, that's very important that you offer that to your patients. So Dr. Camp, what about other options for people with low vision? You know, you know, once patients get to the point where they've kind of reached that low vision threshold, um, and there's some different numbers that make them qualify, but we we're very fortunate locally to um, have an organization called the Lighthouse of Minnesota that has um, in, I'll call it in-house counseling, um, everyday living, you know, uh, uh, treatment, uh, not really treatments, but uh, teach them how to get along with cooking, for example. They've got a, a full kitchen set up in there to teach people how to cook if they've got low vision. They have a, a little shop called Peepers where you can buy some of these low vision devices. Um, we have in the, in, in the area, we've got several low vision specialists that, that actually can do, you know, specialty eye exams and fit them with devices. Um, we actually have a, a, a place in Palmetto called the Southeast Guide Dogs, world renowned if it gets to that level. You know, some people need the, the guides. And then there's simple things, or what I think are simple things now that they've been out a while, but just e-readers, iPads, different tablets where you can basically just enhance the backgrounds, the size of print. It's amazing what somebody can benefit by just having, you know, reading back as part of their life. Well, now, Dr. Ahn, um, do you see patients for second opinions? Absolutely, Jill. I'd be happy to see any patient and examine their eyes because many of people have seen another optometrist, ophthalmologist, have questions, uh, want to know what the options are available for treatment. So I'm open to seeing any patients for second opinion. Yes. So you don't have to be a patient of the eye associates to receive a second opinion? Correct, again. correct, okay. yes. All right, well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Camp. Thank you, Dr. Ahn. And thank you, audience, for joining us today. We'd love to hear from you with your questions about retinal conditions. Just give us a call at the 1-866-865-2020. Or if you'd like to make an appointment with one of our award-winning doctors, we'd love to see you. Just call the toll-free number on the screen. Our goal is to keep you seeing your best and enjoying your life. So for now, I wish you the best sight for life and so much more.